Good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to be here virtually, but as, as you know me, if, and if you don't, I would be walking around looking for hugs at this point and not virtually. So I am hugging you virtually from Ottawa, Canada. So it is a gift and I have to thank the chairs and the board and Becky and Joe, all the people who orchestrate putting this together and holding it together now for two full years. I don't think last year as we did a virtual, we thought we'd be back virtualing again, but here we are. And I, what I love about being an Adlerian psychology is you give us obstacles, we overcome them. I think that was a real modeling for both Rudolf Dreikers and um, Alfred Adler, uh, who both demonstrated transitions in their life constantly. And I think we have really great role models in Eva Dreikers Ferguson. And I remember Edna Nash, some of you remember Edna, who was a Canadian, worked closely with Rudolf Dreikers and really was one of my mentors in terms of, uh, of Adlerian psychology. But I think it's been such a gift because I always say Adlerian psychology is a way of life. And yes, it is a psychological theory and practice, but mostly it gives us life skills to be the kind of encouraging, embracing, enthusiastic way of being in the world. You know, I think when I, when I first was introduced to quotes, positive psychology, I laughed to myself thinking, I think we had positive psychology in the early 1900s led by Alfred Adler. Um, so it's always fun to watch what's happening in psychology and in education because it's as if everything that gets created is new. And as you know, we are intergenerational beings and therefore very little is new. We just repackage it. So this morning we're going to be talking about transitions and we live in transitions and we're always faced with transitions. And I use the word turbulent times because at this point, I think what's happened to all of us is that we can't quite get our, our bearing. We, we can't reason ourselves into and out of the pandemic. Uh, it's just been somewhat of a surprise and, and relate, relates to helping us to feel like we look to community then and seek community. And I think that's where Cassie has served such a great gift from around the world is she, it offers us a community to come together. And I agree the, the Sabina leading us in, in the monthly or bi-weekly uh, meetings has been really cool and being able to just show up and there everyone is. So thank you. Uh, today I'll take you through some of your transitions and you will be working. I'm known as a, as a person who generally I give you material, but I also expect that you're working along with me. Um, so if I think about Alfred Adler and Rudolf Dreikers, I think that in many ways, they, they lived in very turbulent times. And I think as we go through the presentation, we'll talk about what was happening with Adler when he was working in three hospitals uh, at, at the turn of, uh, during the World War. And then of course, all through the, the plague. So there are many, many similarities in some ways to what we're living today. But the difference is, of course, we're living in an information age. So people are not isolated. We can actually know a lot more than we ever knew before. So if we look at the word turbulent, it really means not calm, not controlled, stormy, um, a lot of confusion, perpetuates conflicts, and often feels like we are in disorder. And so I think that that's where we look to Adlerian psychology now to kind of um, figure out what it can help us with in, in getting started into our lecture this morning. So here's a visual that probably could be anywhere in the world. Uh, I don't know about where, how you've adjusted to masks, but I think right now it's almost become our, our, a part of us. And so I have masks in my car, masks in my purse, masks in pockets, um, because it, we are still working through in Canada where we don't have the freedom that some of other countries do yet. Um, and so I'm very comfortable now, I must say, wearing masks, and I'm not sure at what point we're going to feel completely safe enough to move without them. So in times of uncertainty, what we see is new dynamics appearing and old ones intensifying. Uncertainty for any human being increases fear. And as fear rises, we focus on security and safety, the tendency to withdraw, 
and go inside ourselves, we kind of at times can be more self-serving. We get caught in what will be good for me rather than what will be good for all. We can become defensive. We sometimes focus on smaller details, what we can control. Sometimes it's more difficult to work together in COVID. Now I've had the different experiences. I felt that people have stretched more, have accommodated more, have been attempting to, to kind of work with uh, others. But I do believe that many people also have struggled to work together or to be very isolated. It's very hard to focus on the big picture. And in the information age, the pictures are so big that it often actually overwhelms us. Um, so when we deal with psychological impacts of fear, stress deprives the human brain of the ability to see patterns. People become reactive, and we've seen this in our country where uh, the vaccines were slow to have uptake and, and uh, they also didn't, we didn't have the numbers at the beginning. And people, you could bring, it brought out the worst in people as well as the best in people. We lose capacity to see our lives as part of the larger system, that this isn't happening just to me. The physical problems sometimes are sleep, restlessness, sudden anger, and unpredictable tears. The expectation, now this is a quote by Rem and, and, and it's, it's speaking to compassion fatigue, which many of you I'm sure as, as uh, therapists and educators have heard the word compassion fatigue, because those of us who are working in the field and helping and being frontline workers are actually uh, attempting to always be compassionate, but we get very tired also. I mean, after I've done eight clients a day, I feel like, you know, almost I'm in a spin. Um, and I have to kind of really do some calming. So the expectation that we can be immersed in suffering and loss daily and not be touched by it as is unrealistic as expecting to be able to walk through water without getting wet. So I think a lot of us feel that we are, I feel privileged to be on the front line to tell you the truth of, the, of this situation. And so on the other hand, I have to be really aware of self-care and that's what we'll talk about later as we go through. So Adler's experiences, this is about courage and social interest and responsibility. Adler's experience through the war years and the pandemic led to a significant shift in his thinking about the human condition. It challenged his perceptions of political socialism and ideology as he saw the reality of warfare, death and destruction, and the misuse of power and its devastating effect on the well-being of humankind. He spoke not only of the illogic of war and conflict, but established a psychology that reflected a worldview of cooperation and collaboration, nonviolent problem solving. He called for courage and risk taking and personal responsibility for individuals to be willing to contribute to, make, to the making of a nonviolent cooperative world. To quote Adler, people always make mistakes if they do not see that their whole significance must consist in their contribution to the lives of others. And in fact, social interest was one of the byproducts of Adler's experience in, in the war, but also in the, in the, the, the hospitalization and the illnesses and the, the death that he witnessed after the war. So in many ways, we are indebted that, that in some ways, every experience that Alfred Adler had, as was true of Rudolf Dreikers, affected their theory, altered their theory. They worked to update and be current in terms of their beliefs and the positions they're taking about what is, what is happening and what do we as individuals need to do and how do we do it as communities and how do we create social equality and, and social connection. So Alfred Adler stated, it is the individual who is not interested in his fellow men, who has the greatest difficulties in life and provides the greatest injury to others. It is from almost, it, it is uh, from among such individuals that all human failure springs. So in many ways, what came out of this time for Adler was the whole concept of Gemeinschaftgefühl, the community feeling. And for Adler, a meaningful community exists only within the, an environment of social equality. He encouraged political and social activism and for individuals to take responsibility for their broader community and ultimately the world.
So this man didn't think big, I, as you can tell. In other words, he, he actually believed from a very young age that he could overcome. Uh, and if any of you remember the stories of Adler, he was a young man who had many, many challenges in his childhood uh, and many transitions in his life. Uh, he, he was um, a child who could not move. He, his legs were bandaged from a very early age and he would sit watching children play but not be able to participate. Um, he also experienced two to three car accidents in his life under the age of 10. He was hospitalized often. And in those days when children went into hospital, the parents could not visit. And so he spent quite a lot of time overcoming and being in, in some ways in charge of his life from a very, very early age. Now, he talked a lot about early recollections, early memories. Um, and this is a little girl probably around the age of four or five, kind of looking at the world and, and observing the world. And you know, one of the quotes of Adler is, we are wonderful observers, but often poor interpreters because we see what we see, but then depending upon our experience, our age, our education, our understanding of the world, ourselves and others, we make decisions, we, make, we draw conclusions. And those are sometimes mistaken beliefs about ourselves, about the world and about others. So in 1931, he wrote this, he wrote about uh, early recollections. Among the psychological expressions, some of the most revealing are individual memories. Memories are reminders we carry with us of our limits and our strengths and the meaning of the circumstances. The memory represents the story of my life, a story I repeat to myself to warn me and to prepare me by means of past experiences so that I will meet the future with an already tested style of life. So I kind of think that from the moment of birth, we have a tape recording that happens and we just tape and tape and tape. And we don't always actually ever know what is on our tape. But one of the ways of learning our tapes is to work with early memories and early recollections. Adler drew many references from early recollections. It contains attitudes towards life, direction of the person striving, hints why a particular movement was chosen, perceived dangers to be avoided, indication of compensatory devices developed to cope with felt inadequacies, evidence of courage or its lack, strategies developed for living in the perceived world, preference for direct or indirect methods of coping, type of interpersonal transactions preferred, the presence or absence of social interest, values given to affiliation, competence, behavior, status, rebellion, compliance, security, core wants and needs and motivators. So many, many times as therapists and, and people who are in teaching uh, Adler Adlerian psychology, we use early memories or early recollections as, a, as a, a way of demonstrating that we always are moving from the, the minus to the plus and always in movement toward. And so I felt that when looking at transitions, one of the best things to start with is an early memory. So what I'd like all of you to do, I'm hoping you have a piece of paper and a, and a pen handy, I want you to go back into your life under the age of 10. Now, for some of us, that's a little far back these days, but I, I'm sure you'll be able to pull something. And if you can't go under age 10, go under whatever age, 15, 20, but particularly if you can get into your childhood, that's kind of important. So choose a memory related to coping with change or a transition. So for instance, you may have moved houses, going to school, a child may have been added to the family. Um, so there's lots of transitions that children experience that they don't get any say in. They don't get any decision making in. And so I wanted to have you look at a memory to see what it's going to already tell you about your transition so that when we move forward into looking at the steps of a transition, your, your story will make more sense. So what you're going to do is describe what you see in the memory, focusing on the child's experience. What feelings does the child experience within this memory? 
What strategies did the child use to manage this change and transition? So would you just take a few minutes and find a memory? It can be any memory, don't judge it. It's not good, it's not bad, it's just a memory uh, related to change or a transition that you experienced under the age of 10. Describe what you see in the memory, focusing on what the child is experiencing, what are the feelings and what are the strategies that the child used to manage it. So just take a few minutes and then we'll be working with a memory. So we're going to come into your life today and staying with the memory and ask yourself, how are the strategies and feelings different or the same in your life today? So if you're facing a change or facing a transition, how are the strategies and the feelings different or the same that you used as a child? Because as early memories teach us, the lessons we learn as a child are often the private logic, the way we decide to see ourselves, see life, and see others. And then what I'd like you to do is rewrite the memory as you wish it could have happened. So maybe you wanted to stay in the same house and not move. Maybe you wanted to give your baby sister back or sell them or I'll have to tell you one of my early memories, which is attempting to sell my sister but it didn't go very well. <laughs> the person actually told my mother. Um, so rewrite the memory as you wish you could have happened. It, it could have happened. How would you change your response, the circumstance and the other people if there, if any present in your memory? Okay, so this piece is going to be important as we now start moving towards understanding transitions, which is really the work of William Bridges. And it's he was around, he started, I think, in the 60s and 70s, talking about how people go through transitions from birth to death and often don't understand the process that they're in because they're often just looking for outcomes, outcomes, outcomes. What will we do? Rather than understanding how change, any change, is a shift in a life situation. So if we moved neighborhoods even, you know, in, in the same place. If we lived with our grandparents and our parents, and then all of a sudden the grandparents moved, or we changed cities, or you went to school, or people came to live in your house that weren't living there before. So any change in a shift is a shift in a life situation. The, trans, the definition of a transition is the inner process through which people come to terms with a change as they let go of the way things used to be and reorient themselves to the way things are now. So we are exactly having this experience right now globally. There has been a major change in many of our life situations. Transition is the inner process we're going through to come to grips with the changes and we have to let go. And this is where people are struggling. We have to let go of the way things used to be. We didn't actually see our grandchildren in real time for 15, 16 months, which was quite, quite a gap. And we, they live, we all live in the same city, which is a gift. Um, but we use Zoom and we used phone and, you know, texts and so on. And so we still felt that we were connected, but we had to figure out how we could let go of what was the way we used to do it and reorient ourselves to the way that things are now. Uh, now, are we all excited, of course, to spend time in real time now? Yeah, that's exactly where most of us are. So transition, managing transitions means helping people to make that difficult process less painful and disruptive. Change is a wall and transition is a gate in that wall. It's there for you to go through. So what William Bridges talked about was the change is really the wall and we have to then figure out what does it represent? What is it? What experiences do I already have related to this, this issue? Do I have coping strategies that I've used before? And then the transition is a gate that, that is in that wall and it's really there that you go through. So when the, the, you know, the pandemic kind of began, a lot of us saw it as a short-term change. 
probably in our minds that we'll be through this. It is now 17 months since I have worked out of my workplace. I have been working from home for, from, for 17 months, which was shocking <laughs> in many ways. And yet I've now accommodated, I'm comfortable in it. And my guess is I'll go back 50% of the time into my office and probably remain 50% potentially uh, on Zoom. But I, I really haven't made the decision since I'm not back at the office yet. So that's the most important thing to realize that there's two parts to this. The change is the wall and the transition is really the gate. Transitions always have losses and gains within them. They are a process, not an outcome. They can only be managed in the present time zone. And one of the biggest challenges we have now are people living in the past, living in the future, and refusing to work within the present, which is the only influence we still have in the pandemic, is what are we going to do today? What are we going to do on this decision? What are the options we have? What are the choices we have? But if we are always looking back saying, well, it was better before, it was definitely better before, I can't believe it. If we only focus on the losses of what's happened, then basically we're not able to move and accept the change and, and work with the change, we actually resist it. So we only can manage change and transition in the present time zone. They are always managed more easily with support and encouragement from others. Now, this is where what I'm seeing in our country is that mental health is at the top of everyone's list. Uh, the governments have endorsed it. They're pushing people to go and into therapy and deal with feelings and work with feelings. And I mean, in some ways, that'll be the positive byproduct of this is, is really focusing on mental health. But it does mean that the support of others and encouragers are often critical. And I think we have become the front line uh, as therapists and as support systems and coaches and so on to be those people so that they don't feel alone as they go through whatever the challenges are. The three phases of a transition process is interesting. The process begins with an ending. We have to let go of the way it was. So if I have lived in a long-term relationship and that relationship ends, I cannot spend forever back in the relationship I had. At some point, I have to let go and move into the next stage of my life which is accepting that that's not part of my reality at the moment, which doesn't mean I can't remember, but it's not staying there. I have to let go so that I can move to the neutral zone, being in two places, old and new. And I need to be embracing, this is the third stage of a transition, a new beginning. And I think many of us in different countries are in this stage probably now. We're, we're starting to figure out, well, okay, what's the new beginning going to be? Or we're already feeling we've had a new beginning. Um, and so we're all in different places in the globe. And I think that's difficult sometimes to be a country who isn't where other countries are. And there's been lots of comparisons, as you know, some people have it better, some people, and it's true. This pandemic has been incredibly difficult for people who are disenfranchised, who are not economically you know, safe. Um, these have brought all of these uh, challenges probably in every nation forward, which is not once again a bad thing because social equality was one of Adler's wonderful uh, goals was that we would all feel socially equal. So many of you I'm sure have heard of the life tasks, uh, Adler called them at that time, the life problems. And he talked of three, which was love, work and social. And then Harold Mozak and Bernie Schulman, who were followers of Rudolf Dreikers and lived in Chicago, developed two extra or two added life tasks, um, the spiritual or the meaning of life and the creative power of the self, which was uh, in the center. So this schema is a way of kind of looking at our lives and trying to figure out, all right, so if I look at my life today, am I in, what, where am I in transitions? Is something changed in my love relationships in the sense of my intimate relationships? Is something changed in terms of my work? Is something changed in terms of how I'm managing and working with myself and my health and my mental health? your spirituality, your meaning of life, has that changed during pandemic? Have you made new decisions like Adler did actually after the war uh, to rethink and add 
the concept of social interest, which was one of the greatest, I think, gifts to the world to consider the concept of having social interest around the globe. And have you in your social relationships, which seem to be a particularly difficult area for many people because they can't see friends, they can't go to their groups, they can't kind of feel, accept on Zoom. So I want you to, for a moment, think of the five circles and just write any transitions that you feel you are coping with in any of these five circles. So what's a transition you're facing? Have you started a new relationship in, in uh, COVID? Have you, you know, started a new job or you've changed your job or you're gone part time? Um, have you been able to find ways to stay connected socially or is that the loss? How are you coping with you? And then what is, what is the meaning of life and spirituality? Has that changed as you've gone through this time? So just take a minute and just put them, you can draw the circles and just put a tra any transitions that you see that you have that might be right now uh, facing you because we're going to do some more personal work now on the transitions. So how many of you were able to find that you're in transition in one of the five life tasks? So it's important to know that we're in this because so often we wonder if we are losing it completely or if we are losing perspective or, and then we talk to others and they say, but I feel like that too. Or yeah, I had the exact same experience. And so that's why communal connection is so important. And that's why ICASI is essential because we can talk to people around the world and find out that we're all in the same boat, right? And we're, we're managing the boat differently. It may be different size, different color, different way of, of conceptualizing, but we have more, you know, Adler and Riker's always talked about, we have more in common than we ever have differences, but we actually tend to focus on differences in this world rather than the, the connections of similarity. So I'm going to ask you to choose one of the transitions uh, that you are facing in your life today. And we're going to kind of do one once more another exercise that will help you to, um, to understand the process of a transition. So what are some of the reactions in each phase of the transition? Have you got, how many of you feel you have where you, you know where your transitions might be showing up in the five circles? So, um, so what are the reactions in each phase of the transition? Well, there's an awareness of loss in the first, the status quo, and then there's chaos, actually, because you're in disequilibrium now, because you're, there's this new piece in your life that you've got to realign. And then you go to the neutral zone, which is what we talked about earlier, and then move up into exploration and rebuilding and a commitment to a new beginning. So that's kind of the loop that we go through as we process transitions. And as Adler would show us, it's often a lot of loss that we have to address. You know, when he made the decision to move to New York, he and Raisa were not doing well in their coupleship and she decided to stay in Vienna uh, and remain there. And so he would go to uh, New York and live there basically throughout the year and come to Vienna each summer to do the summer school. And then he became ill in New York and she made the decision to move, uh, as did Alexandra, uh, to New York to be with Adler uh, for a number of years before he died. Um, and so they were always, he was also living in constant transition. I mean, if you think of his time of, you know, time in Vienna, deciding that he literally was going to become more of a middle class and more disenfranchised, focused therapist and helper, that was an absolutely major commitment on his part. He worked with the circus people. He worked with the people who very, had very little he was he put his office within the area where it's it's more middle class near the uh, the circus area and he actually worked with the circus people uh, at the turn of the century which of course would really be very difficult because as you know the circus in that time was possibly having people in cages or animals or whatever and and it was not a, a good uh, connection for sure in terms of how people lived 
So Adler was a role model of always facing transitions. <laughs> and I think he and Dreikers taught us that, that life is changing constantly and that it can't stay the same. So we do have to go through the loss, feelings, the chaos. We do need to come to neutral zones as to here we have the past and here we have the future and we have to make some decisions in the present as to how we're going to manage it as we go forward. So we see the loop and the chaos is which, which really throws people off. When they go into chaos because they're letting go, they actually feel uncomfortable and they feel like, oh, I don't know what I'm holding on to. Does this sound familiar from the pandemic? I don't know what's really strong. And so they feel unbalanced and then they have to then begin to reorient and to explain their story in a different way to move to a commitment to a new beginning. So in some ways, courtship in a relationship, right, can be the beginning. And then there sometimes is reevaluation and chaos and decision making and so on. And then we come to a new beginning, whether this is going to be a relationship we're going to remain in or a relationship we're not going to remain in. But we are always in the process of change, transition, endings, neutral zones, beginnings, and a resonance with what will work for me, as well as there's resistance to change. So there's always process and outcome in every successful transition. So we're, there's always an intention, right? We have a process that is always moving. We have an intention, as, as we know, movement is really what we watch when we are working in therapy. It's not what people are always telling us. It is also what is their behavior showing us and what is their movement towards and away from. Uh, what is the capacity we have? And what knowledge do we need? And how do we move ourselves into a more reflective culture rather than a reactive culture? So how many of you found that you could fill out? Um, uh, I'm just going to go to the questions now. So I want you to choose a transition you're currently facing and outline your feelings, thoughts, reactions you are experiencing or have experienced when facing this transition. So what feelings and thoughts and reactions were present when you were facing this transition? Because we know in Adlerian, we have to look at feelings, thoughts, and reactions, which is movement to understand how people are interpreting the reality. So list all the losses that you feel you have going through this transition. So if it is a loss of somebody's life, um, you know, we've lost many, many people in, in the pandemic and COVID. And so there's losses that we are maybe grieving. And by the way, this is a grief process too. You have to kind of deal with loss and then decide how you're going to manage it and then move somehow into transition. And it takes time. So lifts list the losses of in, the, in this transition and the gains. And what images come to you when you think of your transition? So if you tried to create a picture, what comes to you when you think of, of your transition? Because sometimes when we, and I often have pencils and crayons and, and um, pens and pencils so that people can draw the image that comes to them when they think of their transition. Because this is a whole other way at getting out the pictures in our head, the way that we're conceptualizing things. And when you look at it in a picture, sometimes you see what, what's missing, what the other options are you may have, or the, the gains that may be in moving forward. How is this transition affecting your life at present? So if, if let's say you're at the moment, I have many people who are rethinking the workplaces they're going back to and whether they're going to return back into the old workplaces. I have many people, we have a very high rate of separation and divorce in our community right now in terms of couple work. Um, and so very much there's people are really making major choices at this point uh, in redoing and redirecting their lives. What phase of the transition are you living in now? Are you in a letting go? Are you in a neutral zone? Or are you in a new beginning? What coping strategies would be or have been most helpful in managing this transition? So 
Sometimes it's good to talk to people who've already been through something that you're going through, or sometimes it's writing. I don't know if any of you journal or, or keep, you know, notes on things that are going on and, and how you can see the changes from week to week or month to month in terms of how you're feeling, how you're thinking. Uh, I've, I've been journaling for a long, long time in my life. And it is interesting sometimes to go back and read 10 years ago or five years ago and, and realize that, wow, I've shifted in thinking about that or my feelings about it, or I've made a different decision about it. What positive action have you taken or could you take as a result of facing or working through this transition? So what are your coping strategies and what positive action have you taken that could um, and you, or could you take as a result of facing and working through the transition? So John, were you able to find transitions in your life or? Definitely. Pretty much in every single of the five domains. So that's definitely turned up for me and it, it, it did relate to my memory as well. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. As you finish the transition exercise, go back to your early memory um, exercise and see if there is any connection that's quite clear about how you do movement, how you show up as, as a child and how still today you may be utilizing or using some of the same coping strategies. Because remember that in times of stress and distress, we often regress. We all, well, I'd say pretty much always, um, but we're always going back to our early private logic. And that's where we get so adamant. It's like, this is the only way. You know, I love when I'm doing couple therapy and then I'm doing family therapy and everybody is sure they're right. Everyone is sure that their private logic is somehow superior or better or the right way. And I'm sure a lot of you are having that experience. And, and it's, it's, I mean, I don't obviously smile, you know, as I'm listening, but it is amazing. So I will sometimes say to couples, can we just stop and we'll go back into your early childhood and see if you can pull a memory about the way that you observed arguments or what did you see in arguments as a child? How did people resolve differences as a child that you observed? Because so often we're using coping strategies that we learned under the age of 10. And the more insecure or upset or emotively uh, reactive we are, the more we're back, as I call it, into our child logic. And what I love about my couples is when they get this concept and understand it, they can name it while they're in an argument with each other. They can say, whoa, 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 where are we? <laughs> like I'm, and, and one man said to his, his partner, well, I'm in the kitchen with my brother and he is bugging me. And I really think that he's trying to control me and I don't want it and I'm really mad. And she said, hmm, well, I'm in my bedroom and I've just had an argument with my parents and I've walked out and I'm gone and I'm not going back down. <laughs> so look at the look at the dance this couple is doing, right? One wants to lash out and be angry and the other one completely withdraws, goes to the room and is never coming out again. So you begin to help them and I use a lot of humor in my work because I think we have to lighten therapy up as well in helping people understand that our private logic is developed, as I see it, uh, you know, well under the age of 10, and, and we don't know it. So we're traveling along in life with this suitcase packed about how do we get our own way? What is love? How are, you know, people in coupleship supposed to act? Um, how am I supposed to problem solve different than I problem solved when I was a little person? And the more stressed you are, and the more uh, kind of in turbulence you feel, the more you are struggling and often go back into how life should be, will be, must be, and they come in firm, you know? And I was working with a family recently with a 15 year old who is a non-talker and the parents are both problem solvers where you put your, your issues on the table, you write them down, you negotiate, and they have a, a child who refuses to talk. And they had no skills. It was like, they try to convince her. It's always better if you get it out. It's always better if you express it. This is really the best way to go. 
And of course it makes her more adamant at the age she is that she's not talking at all. So what I suggested is they start passing notes to each other and it's become hilarious. They're now writing letters to each other and they're because they're writing letters, they have to think, right? So there's rules. They can't just write ugly things to each other. They have to think through what is it I need or what is it I'm asking or what am I wanting? And the notes are getting longer and longer <laughs> between them. And they're actually, I have to get them back to some verbal communication <laughs> eventually, but they are getting along much better. And we don't have her hiding in her room as much because now we have a different way of communing or communicating with each other. So I think that our work as Adlerian therapist is really to understand that, you know, private logic is not ever not affected. There is nothing that can't be connected back in our holism because we're also holistic beings. Um, and I think I talk a lot with my clients about social equality and what that really means and how do you do social equality and, and even discussing what does equality mean in a couple relationship with people? It's hilarious. I mean, I sometimes, and I, I'm very good at looking as if, oh, nothing shocks me. But there are, you know, quite things. We, I had one woman who said, uh, well, if you don't get your own way in the argument, like you're defeated. And then I lose hope. And I just, I just don't know. It creates my depression. And the partner said with the um, young woman, she said, I don't even know how to cause depression. So it can't be me. There must be something else going on. And so what, does, what do people do? They argue about not what really is happening, right? They argue with the surface instead of understanding that, wait a minute, what are the beliefs that are underlying this story? What are the beliefs about relationships? What's my belief about winning and losing? What is my belief about where I fit in the world and what happens to me if someone rejects me, right? What if they say, I just don't wanna be with you right now. Invariably, I find in my couples, one wants to connect fast after an issue and one wants to stay separate for quite some time. Um, and so I actually have had, um, now that we have cell phones and different numbers, they actually talk on their cell phones without pictures because they have to listen. The problem with Zoom often is, you know, you're there's there's a lot more involved like you don't listen because you've got as I'm doing now I'm using nonverbal. I've got an expression on my face I'm lifting my eyebrow and people really see that right and are reacting to that so I, you know I think as therapists and as teachers and as educators we need to be a lot more creative but normalize I think that one of the greatest gift of being a therapist is to normalize what looks to people like the most crazy behavior, out of control, wrong, right? And we can help them to put it into some kind of reality and, and, and a reality that respects both people or the child and the adult. And I think that if we watch little ones, how as they're developing, like if you think right now about how did you get your own way when you were a little girl or a little boy or a little trans? Uh, so how did you get your own way? Like, did you pout? Did you cry? So let's take and let's do this and put it in the chat line if you want to declare what you did. Um, so you go back under the age of 10 and figure out when you were little and you really, really, really wanted something. How did you go about getting it? How did you actually get what you believed you needed as a little person? because these, these decisions often stay with us for the rest of our lives. And we believe, by the way, we're right because it's our private logic. And of course, our private logic is right and not to be tampered with. So just see, this is what I wanna do all the time when I'm a therapist is teach because people don't have the life skills to do what they've been told they really had to do. And living inside families to the degree we have had to live within families has really had to give them more strategies, different ways, family meetings actually work well. Uh, in this family, they have a family meeting, but they, they're with their backs to each other initially because the nonverbals were getting in the way and they weren't listening to the words. They were just picking up the eyebrows and the, the hands. And so you just become shifting it so that basically people can still 
go through it and learn new strategies, but they're not bringing to the table, you know, because 78% of all, all uh, uh, conversation is usually nonverbal, right? And we're not paying enough attention sometimes to the nonverbal that really creates the trigger for people, even on Zoom, for sure. So did we get any, any uh, how people got their own ways, John? Yeah, we've got uh, a number of examples. Do you want me to read a couple of well, them? Just some of the creative ways that I'm sure people have come up with. Yeah, so um, one person said, I would argue uh, verbally and ins insistently. Um, and then they said, now so to my children and it bugs me with a smiley face. Uh, another person said, I had a tantrum to get them to listen. Another person said, I sneak in and I would snatch it. Um, the other, I waited until the other would notice me wanting and would give it to me. Well, the other, another person said I would speak the loudest or loudly. Great. So I want you now to go back to the first exercise, your early memory, because this now brings your private logic as the child into this story. Right. And can you see now, as you look, as John said, he could see a connection. Can you see a connection from your early memory that you were uh, bringing to the table uh, earlier and how it may be affecting how you are going through transitions, how you are perceiving the transition, what stage are you in and how is the, the child part of you? And I don't, I don't, I believe we're holistic. I don't believe we're in parts, but the child's logic, how, how would the child's logic help you in managing these transitions or actually not help you because you have such definite ideas of how life should happen and how to fix things and how we go through it. So I think now let's see if we can make a connection between the memory and whether it's actually showing up in the way that you are also handling a transition and maybe put that in the chat line too if you, uh, if you can see a connection, if you can see some uh, some way it, that it's tying back to one of the transitions that you may be living in. So far, nothing in the chat yet. I think people are thinking about it, but I love how uh, interactive you're being. It's really getting me to think. <laughs> so what are some of the coping strategies, John, you might use in, in helping you manage a transition? In my memory, I was like accepting and willing to take help because <laughs> I was learning to ride a bike and my dad was taking off one of the training wheels. So that transition of learning to ride the bike. Um, but I felt I was able to still like start riding the bike without it with one of the wheels off. And then we took the other one off and like, it was scary, but I still did it. So I think for me, it's with being willing to accept help, but also still, still being willing to take, have the courage to do something that's scarier to move through the current issue. So like, for me, that's like maybe seeking personal therapy or doing things like, um, uh, active self, you know, self care, like exercise, or, um, yeah, talking to friends about life or, or a problem, <laughs> uh, or, or hearing their problems too. I, I think I'm not sure if that answers your question. Yeah, I think that it's really important when you're working in change and transition, which we are all our, our histories and our lives, to remember that we made already a number of decisions as a child about life. And Adler is quoted all over the place talking about sitting on a bench with band laying legs bandaged, watching his older brother, Sigmund, as you may know, Sigmund was his, the elder brother. Uh, and there was great rivalry between uh, sibling, the siblings, uh, between Sigmund and, um, and Alfred, which of course we can look at forward and see that the rivalry with Sigmund Freud would somehow be connected or mirror some of the same feelings that Alfred had uh, probably about Sigmund Freud potentially that he also had about his brother. Uh, and when Adler died at the age of 67, you know, he was in Edinburgh, Scotland and he was going to a lecture, presenting a lecture that night and he dropped dead. Uh, on, on a walk that he was on. Uh, and his father, his brother Sigmund's first reaction was, um, well, you know, he was, a, he was a good brother, but rather quarrelsome. So, so you know, I, I'm very, very sad 
but and, and they said the look on his face was so funny it was kind of like I'm really really sad but he really wasn't an easy brother <laughs> so private logic connects and, and comes back to us in any transition that we have and we also learned coping strategies as a little one like we've learned lots of coping strategies from our childhood that we don't draw on, right? Because we get overwhelmed as we're going through so much and so much change and adapting and managing that we don't call on those coping strategies that would be helpful if we were pulling on, you know, as John said, if I, I, if I understand that help is positive, right? Like many people were not allowed to ask for help when they were little. So when they come to therapy, they're almost worried that you're going to judge them or you're going to blame them that they didn't get it right already. And I always say to them, this is a journey. We're on a journey together. You're not supposed to know it all and figure it all out right now. And so sometimes just linking early memories to what's going on in your life today in the transitions you're living helps you feel positive because you know you have resources and you know you had strategies back then that you can actually pull forward and feel much more grounded and much more present in your life today. So I think if, um, if you think about change, you know, change, remember, is the wall and the transition is the doorway. So in other words, we're going to face many changes but always remember there is a wall, but then there's a door in the, in the wall that actually we have skills and we have beliefs and we have resources, not only by ourselves, but also reaching out and looking for what else we need from community, from friends. And in many ways, the information age and, and Zoom has been a gift also that people have been able to feel socially still connected, even if it was through machinery. And, and so I think there's always pros and cons to everything. So self-care. Now, self-care is really big, you know, as you know, the, the big word um, that is really spoken of a lot now is resilience, self-care, um, because I think it's, it's really important that we are aware of where am I right now? What is my energy level right now? What am I thinking right now? What am I feeling right now? How is that then going to affect the choices I'm going to make at this point? And that's really what therapy does. It slows everything down. It brings kind of a time just to reflect and to feel like I, in self-care refers to the intentional actions you take to care for your physical, mental, and emotional health. And resilience uh, and I don't know if you've been reading at all in any of the books that uh, that are out there, um, but the resilience literature and the resilience research is very, very strong. Resilience is our capacity individually and in groups to navigate our way to, through the to the psychological, social, cultural, and physical resources that sustain our well-being. So I, I think it's really important that if you want to go forward with the material that we're talking about today, that um, you look at Michael Unger's work or you look at, you know, William Bridges' work in, in transitions, because in truth, self-care and the understanding that we are resilient, that we can go through things and we, as you, as Adler and Dreikers both modeled, we can learn from it, we can make new decisions by it. We can reflect and actually sometimes make a completely different turn than we ever expected we would make in our life. So what are the strategies for building resilience? What can we do ourselves? Well, breathing is really important. And one of the things that people have been doing is research to find out where people breathe. And what they've discovered is very much in your chest. And many, many people have gone to emergency departments and thinking they were having a heart attack because they had held so long that basically they were reacting their body was just reacting it wasn't getting enough oxygen so we are to do deep breathing regularly rather than up in our chest present time zone <clears throat> you know i think adler always talked about here and now what is it we can do now i remember bob powers and jane griffiths often in their demonstrations they would you know the the clients would be saying what they were going to do in two weeks and what they were going to get rid of and he'd say but what are you going to do right now 
when you leave this session, when you leave this therapy, what are you going to do in terms of changing your attitude or your behavior or your choices? What will you be doing? Because lots of us have great intentions, but that is not what produces change. Being fully present. I mean, mindfulness is a big word out there in society as well. And there are, you know, John Kabat-Zinn, there's lots of people who have really specialized in developing mindfulness uh, strategies and writings. Ask for what you want and need. That does not say demand. It says ask for it. Re recognizing what it is, to, what is it I want? I often do this with families and couples. Let's talk about what you want right now, each of you. And then people can hear what people want instead of turning it into demands and, and negatives. Understanding your emotional reactions. Like where are these emotions, these feelings coming from? Because we know that there's thought, feeling and action. And as Adlerians, we work a lot with helping cognition, but also in helping people make sense out of their emotional reaction. So then they begin to make more sense out of their behavior. Manage the chatterbox, the fear, the anxiety, the uncertainty, the discouragement. Trust social connections. Belonging, we know, is a basic need and, and support is necessary. Ask for help. I must say in, in Ontario, it's been so endorsed mental health that people aren't even questioning. They just are really ready to ask. Gratitude. You know, I think that as Adlerians, we have a, a philosophy, a psychology, a way of thinking that is optimistic. We are really an optimistic psychology. And I think that that's always been a gratitude to me that in 1973, I had my first Adlerian teacher who really impacted my life and I was in my 20s. So it was pretty neat to think that I could be grateful and she's still alive in Tucson, Arizona at, at 94. Uh, she keeps telling me that, you know, Adlerians live a long time. Ansbacher was 103. Uh, you know, so I always say maybe this is the psychology we should all hang in with. Have the courage to be imperfect, which Rudolf Dreikers, you know, modeled and talked a lot about. Embrace your sense of humor. I mean, we do have to laugh with ourselves, not at ourselves, but with ourselves. Exercise, nutrition, sleep, celebrations, validation and appreciation. I think those are all self-care. Building resilience is not a solo project. It takes a village. We have to have opportunity. We have to have some place to live. We do have to have some connection on an emotional level. We have to have resources. We have our cultural embeddedness. We have our teamwork and our communities uh, and, and our health. So Alfred Adler, and I'm gonna close on this, <clears throat> talked a lot about courage. And I think both he and Dreikers were really courageous men. I mean, to leave everything and start again. And I mean, I think Rudolph, he went to Brazil and then he came to New York and then he finally settled in Chicago. So, I mean, the courage to move in, in those places so much. So what is courage? It's the willingness to risk failure. There is only one danger, Adler said, I find in life. And that is indeed is a real one we may take too many precautions. Courage is not, is not ability one either possesses or lacks. Courage is the willingness to engage in a risk-taking behavior regardless of whether the consequences are unknown or possibly adverse. We are capable of courageous behavior provided we are willing to engage in it, given that life offers few guarantees, all living requires risk-taking. Overcoming difficulties leads to courage, self-respect, and knowing yourself. And I'm going to close with the slide, life is movement. <laughs> Here comes the big wave. And I see it as a wave of gratitude and a wave of joy and love and connection as I feel at a Cassie and generally on this planet. And I'm actually really grateful that I got to live now. People say, I wish I wasn't living now. It's so difficult. And I think I'm really happy to have any life, any day I have. And so I I actually endorse um, Alfred Adler's concept that we are always in movement, whether it is internal, external, or whatever movement, social movement. But thank you, everyone. You're a wonderful audience. And um, I hope you've learned something about yourself. I hope you've learned something about transitions and managing change. And, and the, really that we are part of a, of a human community and it's a great ride and a great deal. And I want to thank all of you. I'm so connected to so many of you and you're part of the joy of my life. So thanks very much.